Okay, we're doing Parsha's bow on page 340, 341. That's where it begins. You can follow if you'd like. You don't really have to. And Parsha's bow brings us really to the concluding section of the, uh, uh, the ten plagues. And begins, Yomar Hashem al Moshe. Hashem says to Moshe, Bo el Paro, come to Faro, ki ani hichbadeti as libo, because I hardened his heart. Be a slave of Adov, and the heart of his servants. Laman, Shose Ososai Elubakirbo, so that I can perform my signs among them. That is to say that Hashem says, Why does it, what, what, is, uh, what happens, happens? What does that mean? You know, Moshe tells Pharaoh, let the people go. Pharaoh says, uh, no, I'm not going to. So Pharaoh says, all right, I'm going to make you. So if he makes them, he does a plague, right? He turns all the water into blood. He turns the frogs all over the place. He has hail fall down and kill all the animals. You have all types of diseases. And, er and every time, pretty much, Pharaoh says, okay, you can go. And now it says that the reason that Pharaoh keeps changing his heart, Hashem says, I hardened his heart. I, I, I made it so that he'll do that. So, we, you know, we have to understand this on a number of levels. Firstly, what does that mean, he hardens his heart? Because what was the goal here? The goal was to take the Jewish people out of Egypt. That's the goal. Pharaoh is holding them back. So God tells Moshe, I want you to be my messenger. You're going to go and get the Jews out of Egypt. Right? That's your job. So Moshe goes, and he tells him, let the Jews go. Pharaoh says, forget it, I'm not letting him go. And so he says, all right, I'm going to show you, you have to, God sent me, God's more powerful than you, and, I'm going to, and you're going to let him go. And he sends a plague, and Pharaoh says, okay. So the goal's accomplished. Then God goes, Hashem goes, and he, may, he hardens Pharaoh's heart so that Pharaoh now changes his mind. So then clearly, the, the goal of getting the Jewish people out of Egypt is, must not be what Hashem wants. Because Pharaoh repeatedly says, okay, and repeatedly Hashem stops him from doing it. So it must not be that that's the goal, right? Okay, it must not. So the point is, is that it is the goal, but it tells us in the sentence a secondary, if I, I don't even know if you'd want to call it secondary, but a deeper and not as direct goal. And that is, as it says at the end, Laman so that I should be able to perform my signs among them. That is to say that this, Hashem is going to show the world once and for all who he, that He exists, that there is a God, there are ramifications for your actions, mm -hmm. that, that when you have to do something because God says, you have to do it. And He's not going to show us every time we ask. This is it. He's going to do it. And even though Pharaoh was prepared to let the Jewish people out, Hashem is saying, I want to make this occasion the occasion where everyone sees, without a question, who I am. Now, you know, we have people, uh, they'll come and they'll talk to me and they'll say, you know, I, I, I'd like to believe in God. I really would. But my parents didn't give me an education. I don't know much about it. I'd like to believe in God. All I'm asking is that God should take this, this phone and lift it up three inches for a minute. If he could cause that to happen, I'll believe in God forever, and that'll be it. Well, we all know God's not going to do that. So why, isn't he, why wouldn't he do it? Why wouldn't God do that for you, to lift up the phone so you'll know that God is existing? So besides the fact that definitely, good morning, definitely that's not going to work. If you actually, if God would cause this phone to go up in the air, it would not cause you to change who you are. We believe it will. But sooner or later, the emotion will wear off. You'll start to question what you saw. You'll start to question if it really happened, and it won't have an effect. But the real reason that Hashem won't lift up your cell phone to prove that he exists is because he already did it. He's going to do it once. He did it in Egypt. He starts with the ten plagues, and he ends with the giving of the Torah. And over and over and over again, God reveals himself. God interrupts nature. God shows the world that he exists. And therefore, he's not going to do it anymore. So we now know that while the goal of coming out of, the, of, of um, this whole situation, of Moshe going to Pharaoh, the, real, the, the ultimate goal, as we know, is the Jews to come out of Egypt. God promised Abraham the Jewish people would go to Egypt and they would come out from being slaves and to be wealthy and to become a great nation. He promises them that. So we know that's going to happen. 
And that is the goal. But there is another goal, which is that the world should come to the realization that there is a God and who that God is, and that God has a relationship with the Jewish people, and that God has a relationship with all pe peoples and all, all things in the world, and there are ramifications for your actions. That fact is what happens here. It begins here with the Ten Plagues. It concludes at the giving of the Torah. And from that point on, God is not going to lift up your phone. He is not going to make something happen to prove that he exists, because he already did it. Right? It's, it's a done deal. It's like there's a, a famous story they say about, you know, um, about a man going to the Louvre in, in Paris. I went there this summer myself. So you have all these amazing works of art, but certainly one of them everybody wants to see is the Mona Lisa. And it's so funny, because the Mona Lisa, I think, in comparison to some of these other art, uh, works of art, really pales. Um, not only that, but they have works of art there that are like two stories tall. And this thing is like a little tiny painting. It's not, not much of a painting at all. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, it is an interesting painting, and it certainly has a lot to say. So, you get a, so the story is told that a man came, and a special guy, a wealthy man came, and wanted to go see the Mona Lisa, so the curator of the museum gave him a tour. And he brings him through the museum showing all the things. And he goes to the Mona Lisa and he's there with his friends. And the curator and the curator says, you know, voila, here is the Mona Lisa. It's the beautiful painting that everyone talks about. And the man sees it and he looks at it and he looks close and he moves up. But it's very small. He was very close to it and he looks at it and he, he says, you know what? I don't know. I don't know. It doesn't seem like much to me. There's such, everyone's talking about this painting. It's such a great painting. It's not such a great painting. I don't know if, it, if, it, if I would consider this wor <coughs> worthy of, a <coughs> excuse me, of what everyone says. So the curator is listening with the usually uh, stereotypical, what we would say, French arrogance. Mm. And he's not interested in what this rich Texan or American has to say. So he finally says to him, listen, sir, the worth and the importance of the Mona Lisa has already been decided. The world knows that the Mona Lisa is an extraordinary and a special painting. If you, if it's you appreciate it, you don't appreciate it, it's not the issue. It's already been known that this is an amazing painting. The only question is, is are you able to recognize that? Right? That's where the issue is. The issue is, you, are you going to have enough intelligence, enough seicha, enough taste to be able to look at this painting and see the beauty. Not that there's no beauty if you don't see it. There is beauty. That the world, the critics, everyone has already decided. The question is, will you see it? And that's the same thing here. The world knows now that God exists. He did all of these things that the Torah tells about. <coughs> that amazing, enormous miracles of enormous ramification. Lives were lost. Money was lost. Things happened. Right? The man and God touched at the giving of the Torah. I mean, all kinds of things went on. That's already been decided. There is a God. But the question is, are you going to be able to understand that? Are you going to be able to see that? Not that God has to prove to you that you have to lift up a cell phone. He's going to lift up a cell phone for you. That's not, he's not going to do that. He's already been proven. Now it's up to us. Now that's the point of, one, of why it says what it says here in the beginning of the Parsha, to teach us that, that you may know that I am Hashem, that the world knows that he's Hashem. That's one of the main purposes of the whole story. That this is the proof, right, for, for that purpose. So now, <coughs> excuse me, Faro at the end of page uh, 340 and 341 finally says to Moshe, okay, it's enough already. All right, well, you know, go and serve Hashem, here in the last line, right? Go and serve Hashem, Yivdu is Hashem, Elokechem, and he says, and who are you taking with you? Right? You know, Pharaoh says to Moshe, all right, you want to go? Who are you going to take with you? So Moshe says, we're going to go with our young people and our old people. Right? We're going to go with both. We're going to take our sons and our daughters. We're going to take all of our, our sheep, our cattle, and everything, because it's a festival for Hashem. Right? And so then he says back, so be Hashem with you as I will send you forth with your children. Look, the evil intent is opposite your cases. Not so, let the men go now. Serve Hashem, for that is what you seek. And he drove them out from his presence. So here we see that Pharaoh tell, asked Moshe, who are you going to send? Moshe says, I'm taking everybody. I'm taking the kids and the old people. I'm taking all the stuff, all the animals. And uh, Pharaoh says, I'm not so fast. You can't take the old people. I'm going to take the kids. 
Well, this seems the same, was right? This, was this to get out to have a religious ceremony some way, or was this... Well, Moshe, Moshe never goes to Pharaoh, really, and says, we're leaving forever. He always says, we're leaving for three days to worship God. But it's understood that they're leaving forever. Right? He's just speaking in that manner. So finally what happens is that, that Moshe says to Pharaoh, when we go, God will tell us how to serve him. We'll take some of your animals, we'll take our animals, all of our people. When we go, God will tell us how to serve him. And this seems to be a message that Moshe is telling Egypt. He's telling, saying to Egypt, you know, we don't know yet how God wants us to serve him, but we're, we're not going to take any rules from you. You're not going to tell us you can serve him. Um, no, no, I'm sorry, your Sabbath is Saturday. You're going to have to do it on Sunday. You do it on Saturday, it conflicts with our business week. You have to do it on Sunday. Right? Moshe says, hey, we're not having any of that. We're going, and God will tell us how to serve him. That's the simple understanding. But many of the commentators tell us that that's not a message to Pharaoh at all. That's a message to us. And that the Jewish people here are about to leave Egypt. They're about to become a Jewish nation. They're about to become everything that they were promised to be. And Pharaoh says, right, all right, go. But I'm going to give you these rules. And Moses says, no, you're not going to take, give me any rules. The point being is that when the Jewish nation goes out to become the Jewish nation, understanding how they are supposed to worship Hashem is going to come from Hashem. It's not going to come from the people. It's not going to come from an outside source. Judaism and the essence of what it is and its relationship with God is not affected by what the powerful people of the world say. But what he's telling us here is when Moshe makes this, this statement that Hashem will tell us how to serve him, what he's saying to us is that we all go and we work. We spend our lives trying to be good people, trying to follow the Torah, following the Word of God, trying to help others, do all of the things that the Torah expects of us. And we can know that we put in the effort. And we can know that we dedicate ourselves. But the truth is we really don't know if what we're doing is exactly correct. Now don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that we're following a Jewish law and we don't know if the Jewish law is right. <coughs> Excuse me. Jewish law is right. What I mean is, is that if a person is an intelligent person and they strive to learn more and more and more so they can understand Torah better and teach Torah better, we don't know if that person, he himself doesn't know if he's fulfilled his potential or not fulfilled his potential. He know he worked hard, but he doesn't know how far he got. That he's only going to know when God tells him. That will be after we pass away. We know we have potential, but we don't necessarily know if we fulfill that potential or what that potential is. The Gomorrah illustrates this. It tells a story that one of the Rabbanim went up to heaven. He had a prophetic vision in a dream. And they said to him, what did you see when you went up there? And he said, well, you know what I saw? I saw that it's an upside down world. It's an upside down world. And so what does that mean? The people who in this world are high and the next world are low. And then the next world, and in this world, the people who are low, and in the next world, they're high. It's an upside down world. It's so a confusing the, world. Okay. But, <laughs> so he says, what does that mean? So we simply understand the people here who are low. That means that they're humble and they are, you know, religious, but they're not famous people. They're good people. They're going to be made the stars. They're going to be like the Hollywood stars in the world to come. And the people here who are given talent and beauty and so forth, and they're made so famous in this world, but they're really corrupted people, they're going to be low in the next world. That's what its simple meaning is. But to understand it in light of what we're saying is that you have a person who's given great talent, the ability to speak, to change people's minds, to inspire people. And that person goes and does that. They use their talent, they use a, you know, their physical attractiveness, they use their abilities to help people. And they just dedicate their lives to doing that. In this world, they're given an enormous amount. They're given all this talent, all of this wealth, all of these things in order to use it to help others. And the person does it. In this world, that person is high, right? They're the high people. However, in the next world, we don't know if that person's going to be high either, on a high level. Why? Because what was the potential of that person? As great as that person was, they could have been, had the potential to be much greater. On the other hand, you can have a person who's a simple Jew, 
doesn't have a lot of intelligence, doesn't have a lot of abilities, doesn't have access to a lot of money. Then all that Jew does is go, he goes to shul three times a day and says amen to blessings and yehesh me rabba de kaddish. And, that's, and they give their few pennies to tzedakah. Now that person is a low person. They're not famous. They're not a big speaker. They're not a famous rabbi. They're the lower people. But in the next world, that person might be up on high. Because we don't see how a person is not judged simply by what they do. It's what they do in relationship to their potential. So if one person has potential to do an enor enormous amount, they can, this person has, has the potential to do 5,000 X's, 5,000. They do 4,000. They didn't fulfill their potential. Now the average person might only be able to do 400 of whatever it is. They did 10 times as much, but they still didn't fulfill their potential. So when their day of judgment comes, we don't know how God, what, we don't know how God wants us to serve him. We don't know the ultimate end. We just don't know it. But that, the, one of my teachers taught me, told me a story about a, a famous rabbi whose commentary is in the Talmud. He was also a very wealthy man. And he used to lend money to people in the city where he lived. Right? It's a mitzvah to lend money to, to people. So he, he did. And one time a man came in who owed him money, he was a tailor, and he paid him in an envelope with the money, but the rabbi was learning. And he was learning so deeply that while he took the money, he put it in the book and, and he forgot it was there, and he even forgot that the guy had come, because his mind was somewhere else, and he was studying Torah. So the guy, the, now a couple weeks go by, and the, and the rabbi looks in his, in his book, that has the money that's owed to him. And he sees this man, the tailor, is two weeks late. <clears throat> he hasn't paid. In reality, we know he paid, but he didn't. He thinks he didn't pay. So he goes and he asks the man for the money. <coughs> Excuse me, the man says, I paid you. I paid you the money. I paid you back. He says, you know, you didn't. So he takes him to court, Jewish court. The Jewish court decides on the side of the tailor. The tailor says he paid him back. Right? So they, they say he, does, he paid him back. Now the rabbi, you know, as far as he knows, he wasn't paid back. But that's what the judgment is, that's the judgment. And there, you don't fight that, and that's how it goes. But the people of the city, they didn't believe it. Even though the judgment was that the man paid back. The reality is we don't, the people said, you know what? Something's wrong here. This rabbi is not going to say someone didn't pay him when they paid him. So, the, so they stopped going to this tailor. They wouldn't use him out of protest. Because they said, it's not right that this man takes money from the rabbi. And he went out, went out of business. One day the rabbi's learning. He opens up a book he hasn't looked at in a long time. And he finds the envelope with the money. He goes to the man and he says, I have to apologize. You know what I did was wrong. I, I made a mistake. You gave me the money. The man says, it's too late. I've been destroyed. My business is gone. Nobody would come to me anymore. So the rabbi says, I'm going to get up in shul and I'm going to bang and I'm going to tell people I was wrong that you gave me the money and people will come back to you and he says no they won't they're going to think you're the, the rabbi you're such a nice guy that you're prepared to even make up a story so that I should have a living no one's going to listen so he says I don't know what, what can we do so the rabbi says wait you know you have a daughter I have a son let's get them married and then if I if I, my son and daughter our, our son and daughter get married. No one's going to think that I think you're a criminal. No one's going to think that I believe that you didn't pay me back. Everyone's going to know. So they did it, right? And the man and the, 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 the two kids got married. And, of course, people realized that the tailor was a good person. And, and they listened to what the rabbi had to say. And the tailor was able to make a living again. The point being is that here you have an occasion where people are making efforts they're doing things right and people and you often don't know what's expected of us here this tailor did exactly what he was supposed to do and yet we don't know what how god wants us to serve him we don't know what god wants from us on the one hand it appeared that god was treating him terribly the man lost his business and on the other hand his daughter married the the son of this of this world famous rabbi then the whole world now treats him with great respect so we see often that when a person is in this world, we do everything we can do. We often don't know what is expected of us. We know that we have to follow the Torah. We have to do the best we can. But often we don't realize the potential that we have and the amount we can do. So it's our job then to do everything we can and to keep working and striving and growing and never saying we've gotten to where we should be.
because we never know where that should be actually is. Okay, now, we have, um, of course, one of the most famous things in here, which is the plague of the firstborn. The last plague where the firstborn children are killed. Let's come across it. Um, it's uh, 357, 356, 57, the Jewish people are told to take this, the, right, the blood of the lamb, put it on the doorposts of their house so that Hashem will pass over their homes and that only the firstborn children of the Egyptians will be killed and any Jew who puts this on there, they won't be killed, right? And um, we have a problem. We know that Moshe, Mo, God tells Moshe, go to Pharaoh and tell him this is it. I put up with you long enough. You had all these plagues, you're still not coming through. So I'm going to kill the firstborn every firstborn in the country, human, animal, they're all going, except for the ones that we know, the Jews. But all of them are going, right? God says this is going to happen at midnight. Okay? So Moshe goes to Pharaoh, and the words in the Torah tell us, he goes to Pharaoh, he tells him, God says the firstborns are going to be killed, and it's going to happen at about midnight. And here you notice that Moshe changes the words. God says it's going to happen at midnight. Moshe tells Pharaoh it's going to happen at about midnight. So you say, why would he say that? Why would Moshe why is change? Why more tzaddik than Hashem? How is why that? is he changing the words? Well, that's my question. So he, uh, what is the point? God says at midnight. That means at midnight it's going to happen. What God says is true. Moshe says about midnight. Moshe, for some reason, is afraid God just washes off. That God says midnight, it's going to be three seconds later. So he, Moshe doesn't want there to be a problem. Well, that can't be. Right? I mean, God knows what time it is. Right? It can't be that God's watch is off, that Moshe thinks that God's watch is off. That God, God, Moshe might think that God doesn't know. But of course he knows. There's got to be a different reason. So the commentaries, especially Rashi, says that the reason was is because Moshe understood that Pharaoh would be relying on his astrologers to know when midnight was. And that they could be wrong. And they're going to say that perhaps a second before midnight is still midnight, is midnight. We're going to say midnight is midnight. They're going to say a second before is. Why does he worry? Well, first thing, the first reason that he worries is that there's no such thing as midnight. Because imagine midnight is, 12, is like, let's say, the middle of the night, okay? So a second before the middle of the night, what is it? It's still earlier. It's, before, it's still not the middle of the night. It's nighttime. It's not the middle of the night. The next second, what is it? It's not the middle of the night. It's already after the middle of the night. So when was the middle of the night? We don't really know. Because it's when, whatever you do, you keep dividing and dividing and dividing and dividing. There is no such time as the middle of the night. So Moses says, while God knows when the middle of the night is, even though we don't know, Pharaoh's astrologers are not going to know when it is. They'll make a mistake. And they're going to say that perhaps 30 seconds before midnight, that's the middle of the night. And that time's going to come, and nobody's going to die, right? And so they're going to say God, that Moshe died, lied, and this God is false. You say, wait a minute. Let it, so they're going to say that, right? 30 seconds before is midnight. Then 30 seconds later, they're all going to die. Everyone's going to die. So you want to tell me, because they, they say that God was off by 30 seconds, but still, every firstborn son dies 30 seconds later, because they made a mistake. They're too arrogant to understand they made a mistake. They say God made a mistake. But nevertheless, it happened. You don't think it's going to have an effect? All of these firstborn are going to die? Even though they're off by a few seconds? So Moses it says it's not, the effect is going to be destroyed. That's why he changes it. Why is it going to be destroyed? Because they have a, the Egyptians, they already have a preconceived notion. They have an ulterior idea. They do not want to believe in God. So no matter what we do, they will find a way to say it's not real. They're going to find a way out. So even though a million firstborn kids die at what the Egyptians think is three seconds after midnight, they don't care because it wasn't at midnight. And therefore, Moses is wrong and it's false. And therefore, the point is that Moses says, 
that even though logic should tell you, no matter what time all those kids died, they should be plenty afraid. They're not. Because it wasn't exactly every single detail. So Moshe says, I'm not questioning that God knows. I'm questioning that the Egyptians know. And if they don't know, they're going to use that lack of knowledge as a way to say that this whole thing is a farce. It's not real. It, it, it's a, pretty strange. It's like, you know, if someone says, at, um, you better be home. You tell your kid, you better be home exactly at 11 o'clock at night. If you come home at 11.01, you're grounded for a week. So the kid comes home at 11 o'clock, everything's fine. Kid comes home at 11.01, right, you have to ground him. Now, on his watch, it says 11, and your watch, it says 11.01. Right? The difference is, is that if you don't ground him when it's, your, when, it's really ele- when it's the right time, if you don't do it where he really didn't take you into account, you don't do it, your words are meaningless. He's never going to listen to you again because you didn't do what you said you're going to do. I'm going to put you on, I'm going to make you stay home for a week. If you do this, he did it, you have to follow through. God says, at midnight, I'm going to kill all the firstborn. The Egyptian says, midnight came and went. You didn't kill him. What kind of God are you? Your clock is off. You're not really God because God is never wrong. So you're not really God. So they don't have to listen. So Moshe interpreted it and understood that. But then something else happens. It tells us that that when when it actually when they actually have it here on 357, it was at midnight that Hashem smote every firstborn in the land of Egypt. So God actually did it at midnight, from the firstborn of Pharaoh sitting on the throne to the firstborn of the captive was in the dungeon, and every firstborn animal. Pharaoh rose up at midnight, he and all his servants and all of Egypt, and there was a great outcry in Egypt. So here you got you got to wonder again. God comes to, Mo, to Pharaoh. He tells Moses, "Tell Pharaoh." I'm going to kill off all the firstborn children. Pharaoh has a firstborn child. Lots of firstborn children. Right? He does, right? They're all going to be killed at midnight. Right? This is not the first time God spoke to Pharaoh. I mean, I mean through Moshe. He's had nine plagues. He says the Nile will turn to blood. It turns to blood. Frogs are going to be everywhere you look. Frogs are everywhere you look. Everyone's going to get skin diseases. They got skin diseases. This hail that, that, that is, is hot and cold at the same time is going to fall from heaven. Ad fell from heaven. Wild beasts are going to come eat your animals. They came and ate your animals. Everything God said happened, happened. Nine times in a row, he's batting a thousand. Every single one of those times, it happened, right? He tells Pharaoh, you need to let the Jews go, or I'm going to kill all the firstborn. Do you think Pharaoh should be worried? I think he should be worried. God's batting nine out of nine, right? So now this one's a biggie. What does Pharaoh do? Well, it says here, it was a stroke of midnight, and Pharaoh got up out of bed. He got up. He rose up at midnight. He got up. But Rashi says, what does it mean he got up? Why does the Torah tell us that? So Rashi says, minamita. He got up from his bed. That means that Pharaoh, the king of the country, who himself has a firstborn son, who has all of these people, his subjects, who have firstborn sons, what did he do at 10 o'clock that night? In two hours, they're all going to die. He went to bed. It's not going to happen. He didn't believe it. You know, what is he, an idiot? He, uh, God is batting 9 out of 9. The 10th occasion comes. This is the biggie. He just goes to bed. What, what, is, uh, what, what kind of crazy thing is that? And he goes to bed. And he's awoken by the screams. The point is, is that Pharaoh wasn't just an evil person. Pharaoh was the real deal. He was a heretic. He didn't believe in God. He couldn't. He could, didn't believe in him. He couldn't show that he believed in him. He could not show weakness. Pharaoh was so sure that God was not going to kill the firstborn sons that he went to bed. He went to bed. It was like you and I go to bed at night. The next day we, you know, we're so sure the sun's going to rise the next day. We go to bed. We expect the sun up. Right? Maybe not this time of year, but in general. Right? Pharaoh so sure that this God's not going to kill the firstborn. He goes to bed. Now of course he's woken in the middle of the night, but everyone wake being awoke because Pharaoh was a true believer in his own beliefs and therefore it was perfectly logical for him to do that because you can extrapolate this question because there's another famous question you imagine this here you have Pharaoh Pharaoh's got a country to run it's the most powerful largest country in the world and he's got this guy Moshe coming in and bothering him all the time 
he comes in, he goes to Pharaoh, he tells him, let the Jewish people go, or your river is going to turn to blood. Let him go, or there's going to be frogs in your oven. Let him go, or you're going to get a skin disease. And Pharaoh tolerates it. And he lets him come and go, and come and go, and come and go. Pharaoh is the king. Why does he just kill him? Just kill Moshe, game over. Right? Finish. Moshe and Aaron come to see him. If you don't let the Jewish people go, they're going to be wild beasts going through your city, and they're going to eat anything outside. And Pharaoh says, that's what you think. Pulls out a gun and kills them both. It doesn't happen. It's over. Game over. Why didn't he do that? It's the same reason. Because Pharaoh was not simply an evil person. Pharaoh believed that he was a god. And Pharaoh believed that the god of the Jewish people was not a god. And therefore, if he would go and shoot Moshe and Aaron, if he would kill Moshe and Aaron as a way of stopping this, and then he is showing that he actually believes that it's possible for them to do this. By him allowing them to keep coming and to keep and he keeps saying it's not true, you're not right, it's not going to happen, he keeps what he's doing. But as soon as he goes out of his way to kill them, that's a sign of weakness, not a sign of strength. Because it's the same thing with him going to bed with, with, the, with all the kids about to die and the, and the, at midnight. It's the same idea. Because if he goes to bed, I'm not worried. They're not going to die. Who is this Jewish God business? Forget it. He's not, he's not interested in it. But then he goes to sleep. Because he doesn't, he doesn't leave it. It's the same thing here. He doesn't kill Moshe and Aram. He could have killed him. He had no problem killing him. In fact, earlier, three weeks ago in the Parsha, Moshe runs away from Egypt because he's afraid Pharaoh's going to kill him. Because, because of what he did, right? He killed the Egyptian uh, slave master. So he thinks he's going to kill him. So why doesn't he kill him now? Because he really believes. This is a theological argument. The argument of who's in charge, who's God. This is, he, so he's not going to just knock him off. It's not worth it. He's not going to accomplish anything for him. So that's why. Uh, yeah. But if you read it, and you say he's killing you know, the children. Yeah. Like, it just, it looks terrible, right? Like, um, and you think, isn't there something God could do without... Sure, he got nine other things he did before he, he did this. But also, take into account, firstborn sons are not necessarily children. It'll include children. But you, but you have a firstborn son? You have one? No. I do. He's, he's uh, 30 years old. So... So that's not to say that killing anyone's son is not good. But, I mean, killing human life is not good. But nobody was killed by God who didn't deserve to die. No one was killed who was killed by God who there wasn't a purpose for it. God does not do these things randomly. He doesn't do it without uh, planning, without it being done justly. So we might not understand the justice. We may not understand the idea behind it. But he, but that's what he does. And certainly. That's why when he escalated, he only went ten times before he actually did such a thing. But in any case, we can, I mean, it's, you know, it's a common issue, you know, God killing children. Why do children die? Why do babies die? What's the idea behind it? It's a different class, and we can discuss it. But the point is, is that one thing we know, and I don't expect anyone to accept it without further discussion and singing and, and, and study, but that we ultimately know that when God does something like that, it's just that there is a reason for it, and that it is not an injustice. So in this case, and, and besides the fact, by the way, Pharaoh could have changed it. Pharaoh could have changed it, right? He could have let the people go, and it wouldn't have happened. So um, it's, it's not much different than you decide that you want to, that, you, know, you want to buy a house, right? and they tell you, well, you know, Thornhill's expensive, but you know, we do have three houses. They're built on a landfill. And, you know, there's, there's a, you know, there's a potential for a, a radioactivity in there. And, you know, some people say that it causes cancer. But instead of paying half a million dollars for a house, you can have this house for $70,000. So you say, okay, I'll buy it. I'll buy the house. I mean, you choose to do it on your own free will. And then, not you, somebody buys a house, and, people, and then their, their offspring get, their children get cancer. Why should God punish those children? I mean, he didn't. The people chose money over health, right? Now, it's not 100%, right? Nobody says it's 100%. Now, it's like a person who smokes cigarettes, because you smoke a cigarette doesn't mean you're going to die from lung cancer. Your, the chances are much greater that you will, 
but it's not going to happen for sure. Right? Nevertheless, you still have to make sure that you don't do those things to take care of yourself. It's the same idea here. Okay, um, the Parsa concludes on uh, 364, 365. We're going to hop around a little bit, which is what comes to mind. With the mitzvah of tefillin. We know it's the mitzvah of tefillin, although the Torah doesn't tell us this. If you look here, you'll see. Last line, page 365. And it shall be a sign upon your arm and an ornament between your eyes. For with a strong hand, Hashem removed us from Egypt. So we have this mitzvah, which all we know about it so far is it is a sign on your arm, and it's a ornament between your eyes. Not only that, but even if you read the Hebrew, it, you're not even sure what it is. I mean, not that you don't even know that it's a mitzvah, the mitzvah of tzillin, but let's say even take one of the words. Take the word totafos. Totafos right, means, it means the tzillin of your head. But how do we know this? It's not even a Hebrew word. Rashi says it's like an African word that, that God used here. You put it in here. Like, why? Why would he do that? So, there are many different explanations for this. But, so, but what we're getting from here is this, whatever this mitzvah is, and, you know, the secret, we already know the secret. We know what it is. You and I all know that this is the mitzvah of Tefillin, but it doesn't tell us that. This mitzvah Right? Number one, when you read the words of the Torah, you don't know what it is. Number two, even if you read the words of the Torah well, you're still not sure what it is because some of these words are not normal Hebrew words. So there's some reason God is hiding the meaning of what this means in general, and even if you're an expert, he's hiding the meaning. What is the purpose of God telling you that you should wear something on your arm and between your eyes, and then he doesn't let you know what it is? It's a sign and it's a jewel. That's all it says. How do we know what it is? If you've ever seen tefillin, tefillin are extremely particular. They're made out of leather, and it's got to be a certain kind of leather, and they're made in a certain way, and there's a certain number of boxes, and each box has a certain parsha, right, a little uh, part of the Torah written perfectly on the inside of it, and it has to be worn in the daytime and not in the nighttime. It's worn by men generally, not usually by women. It's you know, by adults, not by children, by Jews, not by non-Jews. All of these rules with tefillin, many, many, many rules with tefillin, how to make them, how to write them, how to wear them, many, many rules. And yet the Torah doesn't even tell you what they are. And this is an important point. Just as this Parsha has in it the actual real proof to the world that God exists, where God exposes himself to the world and tells the world, I'm, I am God. I, I do these plagues, I'm splitting the Red Sea, I'm giving the Torah, I am breaking the laws of nature, I'm going to appear to you, I'm never going to do this again. So you tell your children, you know that there's a God. You don't believe there's a God, you know there's a God, because you saw this happen, right? That's, that's in this Parsha. But there's another thing in this Parsha that is just as significant, but a little more subtle. And that is the fact that when one uses the book that God gave us, gave the Torah. So the Torah is a physical book. You can read it. You can see it. You can evaluate it. And you can, uh, it's written by God. It's not by written by God. You can argue back and forth. The end result will be that it's written by God. But parts of the Torah clearly are telling us that there is something else that you need to know in order to understand how to live as a Jew. And it's not written down. And that's what we call the oral tradition. The oral tradition, which was written down later in what we call the Talmud or the Mishnah, is all of the laws and all of the mitzvahs and everything that God taught Moshe in its full form, with every detail. The Torah, we understand the Torah in one of two ways. But let's just use one for now. One of the ways that we understand the Torah is that the Torah, this book right here that you have here, is the notes so to speak, that the student writes when he goes to a class. Like you go to class, right, and the teacher gives a class for 45 minutes. During that 45 minutes, and maybe he'll say 16,000 words, right? You know, as he's explaining things. What do you do? You take notes. What do you do? You write down. He talks for five minutes. You write down one sentence. 
why do you write that one sentence? That's not what he said. It's just one sentence. Because after the class, you'll look at your note, and it'll remind you of everything he said. Right? That's by looking at it. If you didn't write the note, you'd forget what he said. But the note sort of triggers the rem memory for you. That's how the Torah is. God taught Moshe every detail about every single thing. Moshe wrote, so to speak, wrote notes. God told him what notes to write. Those notes hint to all of the other information that was told to us orally, not, uh, not told to us in writing. It was taught, taught orally. And that, therefore, the, um, the Torah is like those notes. So this mitzvah of tefillin being put here is telling us not only do you finally have a proof that there's a God, that happened earlier in the Parsha, but now I'm giving you a proof that the Torah that you're going to receive in a couple of weeks in Parsha's Yisro when we get there, that Torah that you're going to get, you also have to know that there's more to it than just those written books. And I'm proving it to you now. How am I proving it to you? I'm telling you, the way you will remember that you went out of Egypt is you're going to wear a sign between your eyes and a, uh, a jewel between your eyes and a sign on your arms. You, so, and if you don't, you're going to get in trouble. Yeah. What, what, what is it? What is it? What is it? You know what it is because the oral tradition, the Talmud, tells you what it is. If you deny that the oral tradition is true, there is no such thing. I only follow the five books. You're never going to know what those are. Then even if you think, I'm such a big Torah scholar, I'll figure it out myself from the notes, then tell me, what does totafos mean? It's not even a Hebrew word. It's, it's there on purpose to tell you the oral tradition exists, and it's, and it's real. I'm not going to prove it to you again, God says. Here is your proof. And he puts it here at the end of his parsha. But that's why the tefillin are put in here, and it doesn't tell you that they're tefillin. We learn all about the laws of tefillin later. But all we know here is that the one on your arm is a sign, and the one on your head is a jewel. What that means, we don't know. But the, 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 the Talmud tells us that. And when Moshe wrote this, he knew, and he told it to, to, the, to the elders, and the elders told it to all the people, and the people then told it to their children, and their children told it to their children, until we're supposed to have that information. I have a question. On his time, in his time, men and women were feeling, or just men? In Moshe's time? Just men. The law is, according to... Because I women, they were feeling, but I don't agree with it. Okay. I think men should According to, the, to Halakha, Ashkenazic halacha, under certain circumstances, women are allowed to fulfill positive mitzvahs that they are not required to fulfill, like shaking a lulav. A woman is not required to shake a lulav during sukkahs. It's a positive mitzvah that is governed by time. It's done at a certain time. Therefore, a woman is not required to do it. The Ashkenazim believe that a woman is allowed to do it. If you want to do it, you can make the blessing that says, you commanded me to do this. And therefore, you fulfill the mitzvah. A woman fulfills the mitzvah. It's the same, tefillin applies in the same way. However, tefillin does have a number of other laws that could be affected by the physical reality of the person, but it's the same. So there are, history so it tells us that there were women who wore tefillin. Not women, like many. There were certain individual women who worked on themselves and who grew and who fulfilled all of the, you know, the mitzvahs that they were required to do and wanted to do additional mitzvahs and, for, and, and chose to do this and were allowed to. So, but it's not common. It's, not, it's extremely rare. It's rare throughout history even. Okay? All right, we have, um, let's see. All right. Uh, you, we don't even have to read it, but if you want, it's on 361. We talk about the Passover offering. We can spend months talking about the Passover offering. We spend all of Passover talking about it, so I won't do that now. But one of the things it tells us here is that the Passover offering can only be eaten by a person who is circumcised, that is, a male. I mean, a female can eat it. She doesn't need to be circumcised. But no, it says here in, in line 48, 49, it says no uncircumcised male may eat of it. That is to say, if you have a Jew who would normally, you'd think, be able to eat the sacrifice, the, the sacrifice of Passover sacrifice, which we don't have today, um, he has to be circumcised. If he's not circumcised, he's not allowed to eat it. So if a father would decide he's one of these people who are anti-circumcision, <coughs> but he's not going to circumcise his child, his child cannot eat of this sacrifice. 
he has to be circumcised. So one of the, this is a very serious thing. The Passover offering is the offering that is done to really signifying and celebrating and fulfilling the whole idea of our going out of Egypt. Right? So for, to say that you're not allowed to eat it is a very serious thing. To say such a person can't do it. Therefore, circumcision is a very serious thing. Because for it to say that you can't do this is a big deal. Many people misconstrue circumcision and believe they believe that if a man is not, a, a male is not circumcised, he's not Jewish. I've had people say this to me. They believe this to be true. And that's not true. That's why I'm bringing this up. It's a serious error on the part of, of the people to not circumcise sons. It's a very, very serious, serious thing. One of the, probably one of the greatest things a person could do wrong. But if you don't circumcise your son, your son's still Jewish. Right? Circumcision does not make a child Jewish. So they, like, they tell stories about Rabbi Chaim of Brisk, who was a very well-known rabbi in his time. He was Rabbi Chaim Salavechik. So the name Salavechik you might have heard because there's still his, his great-great-grandchildren are still ra ra rabbinic leaders. So he said that with him, that one time that in his city, they, um, there was some people who weren't circumcising their children, and the rabbis got together, and they wanted to make a rule that that person would not be written in the journal. Like in, in Europe, they had a journal of everyone who was Jewish. Right? The government made them keep it. They kept it for their own, their own knowledge so that they could always look back and see who was Jewish. It wouldn't be a question. And these were authoritative books that were kept by the Jewish community. And they wanted to say that if a child was not circumcised, he would not be put in the book. That is to say he's not Jewish. That's what it basically means, right? So the rabbis wanted to do this as a form of, of um, like a, a ramification for the parents. The parents to realize how serious it is that you're not circumcising your child. And because you're not doing that, your child's not being put in this book, right? Which is like he's not Jewish. So Rabbi Chaim, it's... Uh, Israel, it is what? How is he going to defend Israel if he's not Jewish? What? How is he going to defend Israel if he's not Jewish? Well, it's a long time ago. It doesn't, it's a different time. So he, 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 what he, he says is that Rabbi Chaim wouldn't allow this. He said, you can't go and change the rules. The rules are, you're Jewish, you're Jewish. You can't go and change a law as a, as a fence. In other words, the rabbi said, we need to make a fence to stop people from doing this. So we're going to say, your children are not going to be in the book if you don't, cir if you don't circumcise them. And Rabbi Chaim said, you can't do that. Because that's like telling the world that they're not Jewish. And they are Jewish. The point being, the Rabbi Chaim was sending a message that, a, that a, a Jew, no matter what environment they come from, where they are in their world, where they are in their life, how far away they are from Jewish life, to the point that they could actually live and be, now be an adult, and a Jew who has not been circumcised, right, to actually be that way, you still have a chance, you still have the ability to come back and to become a Jew like everyone else. You are, right, you are already Jewish. When a person is, when we say a person is no longer Jewish, hope is gone. Because everything's gone. The game's over. But if we say, tell them, no, you're still a part of the Jewish people. You're still Jewish. We, you still have the ability to, to make a contribution to the Jewish people, to help yourself. The Rabbi Chaim was saying you never can take that away, no matter what. You can't take that away from a person. And therefore, the fact that circumcision is a horrible thing that if you don't circumcise children, and it means you can't eat from that sacrifice. And it means many other things, and very, very serious things. But it doesn't mean you're not Jewish. And yet that we're never allowed to play with. A person who remains Jewish always has the ability to become a, a holy member of the community, a holy person, a person with the right path. They, never, they don't lose that ability. And therefore, even in the case of circumcision, that story tells us that. And I just wanted to conclude with that because of the people's misconception. So there's a few thoughts on Parsha's boat. I guess we'll stop here. Our time is up.